The Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his own words. They went to him and they said, teacher, tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You just heard this familiar uh, passage from Matthew's gospel a few moments ago, and you probably remembered how Jesus responds to this question even before you heard his response, right? Jesus replied, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Right, we remember it. But what does he mean? You can be, I think, forgiven uh, for hearing this familiar passage from Matthew and wondering, did Jesus answer the question? Is this a little ambiguous sounding Jesus is not known for evasion. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. About eight years ago, I read this article from a British newspaper, and it was on the question, which has question in the article, why do politicians not answer the question? And it was based on some work by a professor who studied the the question at York um, University in England, whose name, I kid you not, is Peter Bull. (laughs) Why do politicians not answer the question? According to him, first of all, to avoid looking bad, to avoid giving the wrong answer. They want to save face. Second, to answer a specific question in an unspecified way, an ambiguous way, kind of Leave some room, you know, down the road, maybe a different audience, a different time, different poll numbers, where you can kind of waffle on the issue, if you will. So don't be too precise. Sometimes, as you know, a politician will respond to a simple question in such a long-winded manner that the question itself gets lost in all the ensuing verbal rambling Noted in the article as well that the more aggressive an interviewer or questioner is to a politician, the less likely he or she is to get a straight answer. And so maybe the adversarial posture of the Pharisees confronting Jesus with their question almost guaranteed an ambiguous answer. No. That is not, that is not what is going on here with Jesus today. So we are deep into the gospel according to Matthew. Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem with his disciples. Events are unfolding and accelerating toward the climax of the story, which is the crucifixion. And today Jesus is in the temple precincts, teaching before large crowds. The religious establishment is there watching him, waiting for a misstep. And they are threatened and resentful. And Matthew, who records this episode, tells us exactly what the Pharisees are up to. They want to entrap Jesus in a publicly damaging way by forcing him to answer an impossible question. Is it lawful, Rabbi? We're all here. We'd like to hear your answer. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So the question for us is, how does this put Jesus in a no-win situation? Well, it's helpful to remember some historical context. In Jesus' own lifetime, the people of Judea and Jerusalem had lost their privileges under Rome, more or less to handle their own affairs, to administer their own taxes because of ineptitude and corruption among Jewish leadership, Rome finally had enough. They wrested that privilege away and assigned their own Gentile governor over Judea and Jerusalem, as you know. For example, Pontius Pilate. And it was those governors who began to oversee the taxation of the Jews directly via Rome. And so the question that the Pharisees pose to Jesus is not about taxes generally. The Jews of Jesus' day paid a lot of taxes, just like Americans pay today. 
There were temple taxes, there were local taxes, and then there were taxes to support the empire, Rome. And so the issue here is not about paying taxes. It is about paying taxes to Rome, to Caesar. And so Jesus says, show me the coin. So they put something in his hand. What is this? They brought him a denarius. Now, a denarius was the primary uh, denomination in the Roman Empire. It's very similar to the U.S. dollar bill. And Jesus takes this silver coin in his hand and he holds it up and he asks, whose image is on this and what inscription do you see written on it? And this particular coin in Jesus' day, this denarius, would have had imprinted on it the image of Caesar Tiberius. And the inscription on the coin would have said, not in God we trust, but Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. So as a faithful Jew, do we think Jesus was unfamiliar with the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments, first commandments, you shall have no other gods but me? Do we think he didn't know the second commandment, you shall not worship any graven image? So far, the denarius is 0 for 2 on the Ten Commandments. So, so, so we can see the cunning of the Pharisees in asking this no-win question. Jesus can say, no, don't pay the tax. This, this coin represents idolatry, worship of the emperor. Faithful Jews should take no part in ungodly systems. Well, you say that in front of the large crowd, and the Romans are going to begin to pay even more attention, always looking for public rabble-rousers. This would have endangered Jesus before the Roman authorities. On the other hand, if Jesus had said, yes, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, you know, better a totalitarian pagan governmental system that at least can keep the peace and administer efficiently than what we had before with corruption and sometimes even utter anarchy. And obviously such an answer would give the Jewish authorities an opportunity to undermine Jesus' authority in public by accusing him of ignoring the commandments and supporting the Caesar, the Roman Empire, Caesar. So what you may hear here is a, is a kind of a none of the above response from Jesus. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. What does Jesus mean? Well, my readings of this text over the years and previous sermons and engagements with people a lot smarter than I am, biblical scholars, gets at this. I think what Jesus wants his hearers to know is that Caesar, Rome, the empire, just like presidents and Congress and politics, and the economy, and the culture wars, and international wars, these are very extremely important realities. Jesus is not saying, don't pay any attention to those. We cannot ignore them. We must give them their due. We must consider wisely, as people of faith, what our role and our witness is in the midst of such realities. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give Caesar absolutely no more than his due. Do not make those myriad concerns of the world to be like Caesar to you, to rule over you, to rule over your heart. For we are to render to God the things that are God's. And what are the things of God's? Everything, all of it. There is no realm of life no matter how passionately you personally feel about some aspect of life, where you are not first and last subject to the sovereign Lord. Jesus here is not making some classic case for the separation of church and state like he was a man of the 18th century enlightenment. Jesus is Lord and he is a Jewish Lord. And he is talking here about our highest allegiance and our identity as sons and daughters of the living God of Israel, Yahweh. Not our identity as this or that nationality or party or gender or race. Pick your tribal passion du jour. 
With this typically devastating insight, Jesus is getting at our real priorities, our deepest loves, how we regard what is ultimate in relation to the things of this world that are penultimate, even if they are very important. And there are so many things before us in our day that are very important indeed. Christians should take care and participate in the significant issues and causes of the day, but never to take them on with a kind of religious zeal or ideological passion that eclipses the most important thing about us. That we belong to God in Christ, that we belong to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, was the famed Dutch theologian and former prime minister of the Netherlands, Abraham Kuyper, who once said, there is not a square inch of creation about which Jesus Christ does not say, this is mine. It's all his. He is sovereign. He reigns over all. So we have this extraordinary opportunity as believers in a time like this to offer a counter witness to all the madness and the chaos, all the hatred and the violence, never making secondary things, even very important and grave things, ultimate things. Jesus, is it lawful for me to pay so much emotional energy fretting and angry about all the problems in the world? Jesus responds, perhaps, but not if it makes you less loving and begins to define your identity. And I would not be looking at all those cares and concerns as big as they are for the source of your true joy and fulfillment. Our society is clearly unwell, but because we believe in the sovereign Lord, it is not so thoroughly diseased that it is beyond hope. Our times are marked by much darkness And Jesus says to his followers, you, you are the light of the world. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you can shine light in a world like this? At the bottom of Jesus' response to the Pharisees today, and to you and to me is this, it's not moral obedience to law. It goes way deeper than that. I think he is taking us all the way down to the beginning when we came into our very existence, the creation story in Genesis 1 where the triune God says, let us make humankind in our image. And the sense of the Hebrew account of that creation story is that the maker of the universe in creating humankind, unlike any other creatures on the planet, is pressing his palm into our chest, his palm print on our lives, like a palm in clay or a signet ring in a wax seal. It is not the minted image of Caesar on a coin, but the image of God, our maker and redeemer. How easily that can get obscured, that image, when we are anxious about the present and pessimistic about the future. I know it happens to me. But this same God by whose word we came into being was made flesh himself. The image became flesh incarnate. And so he lived and died and rose again. And we have this testimony. We believe it. We make it our ultimate source of concern, our all. And it has power when we make it our ultimate concern, to shape us, to mold us, to fashion us as people of light, as people of faith, hope, and love, as people of courage and of joy, despite the world coming apart. And the world is needing that more than it even knows. So what an incredible time for you and for me to be Christians, for this church to be everything that God's calling it to be. Yes, render what you feel you must to Caesar, just enough and no more, but render everything you have, all that you are, to God. Because in Jesus Christ, that is precisely 
what God has done for us. Amen.